I just want to point out both my babies were born on the day they were due, and on the one of the afternoon. It was also a really cool day to be born. Exciting.
The joint session will come to order. Okay, then we do these, okay? The joint session will come to order. The chair appoints as members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chambers. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Clyburn. The gentleman from Massachusetts, the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Sean Patrick Maloney. The gentleman woman from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. The gentlewoman from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester. The gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Stefanik. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Mike Johnson. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. The gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Sparks. The President of the Senate, at the direction of that body, appoints the following senators as members of the committee on the part of the Senate to escort the President of the United States into the House chamber. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer. The Senator from Vermont, Mr. Leahy. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin. The Senator from Michigan, Ms. Snappenow. The Senator from Minnesota, Ms. Klobuchar. The Senator from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. The Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell. The Senator from South Dakota, Mr. Thune. The Senator from Wyoming, Mr. Barrasso. The Senator from Iowa, Ms. Ernst. The Senator from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. And the Senator from Iowa, Mr. Grassley. The members of the escort committee will exit the chamber through the lobby doors. Yeah. 
Now we wait for. Madam Speaker, the Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like 
Madam Speaker, the President's Cabinet.
Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President, and our First Lady and Second Gentlemen, members of Congress and the Cabinet, Justice of the Supreme Court, my fellow Americans. Last year, COVID-19 kept us apart. This year, we're finally together again. Tonight, tonight we meet as Democrats, Republicans, and Independents but most importantly, as Americans. With the duty to one another, to America, to the American people, to the Constitution, and an unwavering resolve that freedom will always triumph over tyranny. Six Thank you. Six days ago, Russia's Vladimir Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. Thank 
President Zelensky, to, their, to every Ukrainian, their fearlessness, their courage, their determination literally inspires the world. Groups of citizens blocking tanks with their bodies, everyone from students to retirees to teachers, turned soldiers defending their homeland. And in this struggle, President Zelensky said in his speech to the European Parliament, light will win over darkness. The Ukrainian ambassador to the United States is here tonight, sitting with the First Lady. Let each of us, if you're able to stand, stand and send an unmistakable signal to the world of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's bright, she's strong, and she's resolved. Yes, we, the United States of America, stand with the Ukrainian people. Throughout our history, we've learned this lesson. When dictators do not pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos. They keep moving, and the cost, the threats to the America and America to the world keeps rising. That's why the NATO alliance was created, to secure peace and stability in Europe after World War II. The United States is a member, along with 29 other nations. It matters. American diplomacy matters. American resolve matters. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated, repeated efforts at diplomacy. He thought the West and NATO wouldn't respond. He thought he could divide us at home in this chamber, in this nation. He thought he could divide us in Europe as well. But Putin was wrong. We are ready. We are united, and that's what we did. We stayed united. We prepared extensively and carefully. We spent months building coalitions of other freedom-loving nations in Europe and the Americas, to, from America to the Asian and African continents, to confront Putin. Like many of you, I spent countless hours unifying your, our European allies. We shared with the world in advance what we knew Putin was planning and precisely how we would try to falsify and justify his aggression. We countered Russia's lies with the truth. And now, now that he's acted, the three wo free world is holding him accountable, along with 27 members of the European Union, including France, Germany, Italy, as well as countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and many others, even Switzerland, are inflicting pain on Russia and supporting the people of Ukraine. Putin is now isolated from the world more than he has ever been. Together, <laughs> together, Together, along with our allies, we are right now enforcing powerful economic sanctions. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system, preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. We're choking Russia's access. We're choking Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Tonight, I say to the Russian oligarchs and the corrupt leaders who built billions of dollars off this violent regime, no more. The United States, I mean it. The United States Department of Justice is assembling a dedicated task force to go after the crimes of the Russian oligarchs. We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for your ill-begotten gains. And tonight, I'm announcing 
that we will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. He has no idea what's coming. The ruble has already lost 30 percent of its value. The Russian stock market has lost 40 percent of its value, and trading remains suspended. The Russian economy is reeling, and Putin alone is the one to blame. Together with our allies, we're providing support to the Ukrainians in their fight for freedom. Military assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, we're giving more than a billion dollars of direct assistance to Ukraine, and we'll continue to aid the Ukrainian people as they defend their country and help ease their suffering. But let me be clear. Our forces are not engaged and will not engage in the conflict with Russian forces in Ukraine. Our forces are not going to Europe to fight Ukraine, but to defend our NATO allies in the event that Putin decides to keep moving west. For that purpose, we have mobilized American ground forces, air squadrons, ship deployments to protect NATO countries, including Poland, Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And as I've made crystal clear, the United States and our allies will defend every inch of territory that is NATO territory with the full force of our collective power. Every single inch. And we're clear-eyed. The Ukrainians are fighting back with pure courage. But the next few days, weeks, and months will be hard on them. Putin has unleashed violence and chaos. But while he may make gains on the battlefield, he'll pay a continuing high price over the long run. And a pound of Ukrainian people, the proud, proud people, pound for pound, ready to fight with every inch of energy they have, they've known 30 years of independence, have repeatedly shown that they will not tolerate anyone who tries to take their country backwards. To all Americans, I'll be honest with you, as I always promised I would be. A Russian dictator of fa in invading a foreign country has cost around the world. And I'm taking robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at Russian economy and that we use every tool at our disposal to protect American businesses and consumers. Tonight, I can announce the United States has worked with 30 other countries to release 60 million barrels of oil from reserves around the world. America will lead that effort, releasing 30 million barrels of our own strategic petroleum reserve. And we stand ready to do more if necessary, united with our allies. These steps will help blunt gas prices here at home, but I know news about what's happening can seem alarming to all Americans. But I want you to know we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. When the history of this era is written, Putin's war in Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Well, and while it shouldn't, and while it shouldn't have taken, while it shouldn't have taken something so terrible for people around the world to see what's at stake, now everyone sees it clearly. We see the unity among leaders of nations, a more unified Europe, a more unified West. We see unity among the people who are gathering in cities and large crowds around the world, even in Russia, to demonstrate their support for the people of Ukraine. In the battle between democracy and autocracies, democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. This is the real test. And it's going to take time. So let us continue to draw inspiration from the iron will of the Ukrainian people to our fellow Ukrainian Americans who forged the deep bond that connects our two nations. We stand with you. We stand with you. Putin may circle Kyiv with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. He'll never, he'll never extinguish their love of freedom. 
and he will never, never weaken the resolve of the free world. We meet tonight in an America that has lived through two of the hardest years this nation has ever faced. The pandemic has been punishing, and so many families are living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to keep up with the rising cost of food, gas, housing, and so much more. I understand, like many of you did. My dad had to leave his home in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to find work. So like many of you, I grew up in a family when the price of food went up, it was felt throughout the family. It had an impact. That's when one of the first things I did as president was fight to pass the American Rescue Plan. Because people were hurting, we needed to act, and we did. Few pieces of legislation have done more at a critical moment in our history to lift us out of a crisis. It fueled our efforts to vaccinate the nation and combat COVID-19, delivered immediate economic relief to tens of millions of Americans. It helped put food on the table. Remember those long lines of cars waiting for hours just to get a box of food put in their trunk? It cut the cost of health care insurance. And as my dad used to say, it gave the people just a little bit of breathing room. Unlike the $2 trillion tax cut passed in the previous administration that benefited the top 1 percent of Americans, the American Rescue Plan — the American Rescue Plan helped working people and left no one behind. <laughs> Folks, And it worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. We created jobs, lots of jobs. In fact, our economy created over 6.5 million new jobs just last year. More jobs in one year than ever before in the history of the United States of America. The economy grew at a rate of 5.7 last year, the strongest growth rate in 40 years, and the first step in bringing fundamental change to our economy that hasn't worked for working people in this nation for too long. For the past 40 years, we were told that tax break for those at the top and benefits would trickle down and everyone would, would benefit. But that trickle-down theory led to a weaker economic growth lower wages, bigger deficits, and a widening gap between the top and everyone else in, in, in nearly a century. Look, <laughs> Vice President Harris and I ran for office, and I realize we have fundamental disagreements on this, but ran for office with a new economic vision for America. Invest in America. Educate Americans. Grow the workforce. Build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down, because we know <laughs> Because we know — because we know when the middle class grows, when the middle class grows, the poor have a way up and the wealthy do very well. America used to have the best roads, bridges, and airports on Earth. And now our infrastructure is ranked 13th in the world. We won't be able to compete for the jobs of the 21st century if we don't fix it. That's why it was so important to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I thank my Republican friends who joined to invest in rebuild America, the single biggest investment in history. It was a bipartisan effort, and I want to thank the members of both parties who worked to make it happen. We're done talking about infrastructure weeks. We're now talking about an infrastructure decade. And look, it's going to — it's going to transform America, to put us in a path to win the economic competition of the 21st century that we face with the rest of the world, particularly China. I've told Xi Jinping it's never been a good bet to bet against the American people. We'll create good jobs for millions of Americans, modernizing roads, airports, ports, waterways, all across America. And we'll do it 
to withstand the devastating effects of climate change and promote environmental justice. We'll build a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations, begin to replace the poisonous lead pipes so every child, every American has clean water to drink at home and at school. We're going to provide, provide affordable, high-speed internet for every American, rural, suburban, urban, and tribal communities. 4,000 projects have already been announced. Many of you have announced them in your districts. And tonight, I'm announcing that this year, we will start fixing over 65,000 miles of highway and 1,500 bridges in disrepair. And folks, when we use taxpayers' dollars to rebuild America, we're going to do it by buying America, buy American products, support American jobs. The federal government spends about $600 billion a year to keep this country safe and secure. There's been a law on the books for almost a century to make sure taxpayers' dollars support American jobs and businesses. Every administration, Democrat and Republican, says they'll do it. But we're, actu we're actually doing it. We'll buy America to make sure every everything from the deck of an aircraft carrier to the steel on highway guardrails is made in America from beginning to end. All of it. All of it. But, folks, to compete for the jobs of the future, we also need a loving playing field with China and other competitors. That's why it's so important to pass the Bipartisan Innovation Act sitting in Congress that will make record investments in emerging technologies and American manufacturing. We used to invest almost 2 percent of our GDP in research and development. We don't now. Can't. China is. Let me give you one example why it's so important to pass. If you travel 20 miles east of Columbus, Ohio, you'll find 1,000 empty acres of land. It won't look like much. But if you stop and look closely, you'll see a field of dreams, the ground on which America's future will be built. That's where Intel, the American company that helped build Silicon Valley, is going to build a $20 billion semiconductor megasite, up to eight state-of-the-art factories in one place, 10,000 new jobs. And in those factories, the average job about $135 $135,000 a year. Some of the most sophisticated manufacturing in the world to make com computer chips the size of a fingertip, the power of the world in everyday lives, from smartphones, technology, that's, the internet, technology is yet to be invented. But that's just the beginning. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who is here tonight, I don't know where Pat is. Pat, there you go, Pat, stand up. Pat. Pat came to see me, and he told me they're ready to increase their investment from $20 billion to $100 billion. That would be the biggest investment in manufacturing in American history. And all they're waiting for is for you to pass this bill. So let's not wait any longer. Send it to my desk. I'll sign it and will really take off in a big way. And folks, Intel is not alone. There's something happening in America. Just look around, and you'll see an amazing story, the rebirth of pride that comes from stamping products made in America, the revitalization of American manufacturing. Companies are choosing to build new factories here when just a few years ago they would have gone overseas. That's what's happening. Ford is investing $11 billion in electric vehicles, creating 11,000 jobs across the country. GM is making the largest investment in its history, 
$7 billion to build electric vehicles, creating 4,000 jobs in Michigan. All told, 369,000 new manufacturing jobs were created in America last year alone. <laughs> folks, Powered by people I've met, like Jojo Burgess, from generations of union steelworkers in Pittsburgh, who's here tonight. Where are you, Jojo? There you go. Thanks, buddy. As Ohio, as Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown says, as Sherrod Brown says, it's time to bury the label Rust Belt. It's time to see the, the, what used to be called the Rust Belt become the, 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 the home of a, a significant resurgence of manufacturing. And with all the bright spots in our economy, record job growth, higher wages, too many families are struggling to keep up with their bills. Inflation is robbing them of gains they thought otherwise they would be able to feel. I get it. That's why my top priority is getting prices under control. Look, our economy roared back faster than almost anyone predicted. But the pandemic meant that businesses had a hard time hiring enough people because of the pandemic to keep up production in their factories. So you didn't have people making those beams that went into buildings because they were out. The factory was closed. The panic also disrupted the global supply chain. Factories closed. When that happens, it takes longer to make goods and get them to the warehouses, to the stores, and go, prices go up. Look at cars last year. One-third of all the inflation was because of automobile sales. There weren't enough semiconductors to make all the cars that people wanted to buy. And guess what? Prices of automobiles went way up, especially used vehicles as well. And so we have a choice. One way to fight inflation is to drive down wages and make Americans poorer. I think I have a better idea to fight inflation. Lower your costs, not your wages. And folks, that means make more cars and semiconductors in America, more infrastructure and innovation in America, more goods moving faster and cheaper in America, more jobs where you can earn a good living in America. Instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. Look, economists, call this increasing the productive capacity of our, economy, of our economy. I call it building a better America. <laughs> My plan to fight inflation will lower your cost and lower the deficit. 17 Nobel laureates in economics said my plan will ease long-term inflationary pressures. Top business leaders, and I believe most Americans support the plan, and here's the plan. First, cut the cost of prescription drugs. We pay more for the same drug produced by the same company in America than any other country in the world. Just look at insulin. One in 10 Americans has diabetes. In Virginia, I met a 13-year-old boy, the handsome young man standing up there, Joshua Davis. He and his dad both have type 1 diabetes, which means they need insulin every single day. Insulin costs about $10 a vial to make. That's what it costs the, the pharmaceutical company. But drug companies charge families like Joshua and his dad up to 30 times that amount. I spoke with Joshua's mom. Imagine what it's like to look at your child who needs insulin to stay healthy and have no idea how in God's name you're going to be able to pay for it. 
what it does to your family, but what it does to your dignity, your ability to look your child in the eye, to be the parent you expect yourself to be. I really mean to think about that. That's what I think about. You know, yesterday, Josh was here tonight, but yesterday was his birthday. Happy birthday, buddy, by the way. <clears throat> For Joshua and 200,000 other young people with type 1 diabetes, let's cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month so everyone can afford it. And drug companies will do very, very well, their profit margin. And while we're at it, I know we have great disagreements on this floor with this. Let's let Medicare negotiate the price of prescription drugs. They already set the price for VA drugs. Look, the American Rescue Plan is helping millions of families with Affordable Care Act plans to save them $2,400 a year on their health premiums. Let's close the coverage gap and make these savings permanent. And second, let's cut energy costs for families, an average of $500 a year by combating climate change. Let's provide an investment tax credit to weatherize your home and your business to be energy efficient and get a tax credit for it. Double Americans' clean energy production in solar, wind, and so much more. Lower the price of electric vehicles, saving another $80 a month that you're not going to have to pay at the pump. <laughs> Folks, third, the third thing we can do to change the standard of living for hardworking folks is cut the cost of child care. Cut the cost of child care. <laughs> Folks, if you live in a major city in America, you pay up to $14,000 a year for child care per child. I was a single dad for five years, raising two kids. I had a lot of help, though. I had a mom, a dad, a brother, and a sister that really helped. But middle class and working folks shouldn't have to pay more than 7 percent of their income to care for the young children. My plan — my plan would cut the cost of child care in half for most families and help parents, including millions of women who left the workforce during the pandemic because they couldn't afford child care, to be able to get back to work, generating economic growth, but my plan doesn't stop there. It also includes home and long-term care, more affordable housing, pre-K for three- and four-year-olds. <clears throat> All these will lower costs for families. And under my plan, nobody — let me say this again — nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in new taxes. Not a single penny. <clears throat> I may be wrong, but my guess is if we took a secret ballot in this floor, that we'd all agree that the present tax system ain't fair. We have to fix it. I'm not looking to punish anybody, but let's make corporations and wealthy Americans start paying their fair share. Look, last year, last year, And like Chris Coons and Tom Carper and my distinguished Congresswoman, we come from the land of corporate America. There are more corporations incorporated in America than every other state in America combined. And I still won 36 years in a row. The point is, even they understand they should pay just a fair share. Last year, 55 of the Fortune 500 companies earned $40 billion in profit and paid zero in federal taxes. Now, look, it's not fair. That's why I proposed the 15 percent minimum tax rate for corporations. We've got — and that's why in the G7 and other meetings overseas, we were able to put together — I was able to be somewhat helpful — 130 countries' degree on a global minimum tax rate. So companies can't get out of paying their taxes at home by shipping jobs in factories overseas. 
It'll raise billions of dollars. That's why I propose closing loopholes for the very wealthy who don't pay a, who pay a lower tax rate than a teacher and a firefighter. So that's my plan, but we have to go more detail later. I'm going to grow. We will grow the economy, lower the cost of families. So what are we waiting for? Let's get this done. We all know we've got to make changes. <laughs> Folks. And while you're at it, confirm my nominees for the Federal Reserve, which plays a critical role in fighting inflation. My plan will not only lower costs and give families a fair shot, it will lower the deficit. The previous administration not only ballooned the deficit with those tax cuts for the very wealthy and corporations, it undermined the watchdogs, the job of those to keep pandemic relief funds being wasted. Remember we had those debates about whether or not those watchdogs should be able to see every day how much money was being spent, where was it going to the right place? <clears throat> In my administration, the watchdogs are back. And we're going to go after the criminals who stole billions of relief money meant for small business and millions of Americans. And tonight, I'm announcing that the Justice Department will soon name a chief prosecutor for pandemic fraud. <clears throat> And look, I think we all agree. Thank you. By the end of this year, the deficit will be down to less than half of what it was before I took office. The only president ever to cut the deficit by more than $1 trillion in a single year. Lowering your cost also meant demanding more competition. I'm a capitalist, but capitalism without competition is not Capitalism. Capitalism without competition is exploitation. It drives up profits. And corporations have to compete. Their profits go up and your prices go up when they don't have to compete. Small businesses and family farmers and ranchers, I need not tell some of my Republican friends from those states. Guess what? You got four basic meatpacking facilities. That's it. You play with them, or you don't get to play at all. And you pay a hell of a lot more. A hell of a lot more, because there's only four. See what's happening with ocean carriers <clears throat> moving goods in and out of America. During the pandemic, about half a dozen or less foreign-owned companies raised prices by as much as 1,000 percent and made record profits. Tonight, I'm announcing a crackdown on those companies overcharging American businesses and consumers. Folks, and as Wall Street firms take over more nursing homes, quality in those homes has gone down and costs have gone up. That ends on my watch. Medicare is going to set higher standards for nursing homes and make sure your loved ones get the care they deserve and that they inspect and they will look at closely. We're also going to cut costs to keep the economy going strong and giving workers a fair shot, provide more training and apprenticeships, hire them based on skills, not just their degrees. Let's pass the Paycheck Fairness Act and paid leave. <laughs> Raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and extend the child tax credit so no one has to raise the family in poverty. Let's increase Pell Grants, increase our historic support for HBCUs, and invest in what Jill, our First Lady who teaches full-time, calls America's best-kept secret, community colleges. Look, let's pass the PRO Act. When a majority of workers want to form a union, they shouldn't be able to be stopped. When we invest in our workers and we build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out together, we can do something we haven't done in a long time, build a better America. For more than two years, COVID has impacted every decision in our lives and the life of this nation. And I know you're tired, frustrated, and exhausted. That doesn't even count the close to a million people who sit at a dining room table or a kitchen table and look at an empty chair because they lost somebody. But I also know this. Because of the progress we've made, 
because of your resilience and the tools that we have been provided by this Congress. Tonight, I can say we're moving forward safely back to a no, norm, more normal routines. We've reached a new moment in the fight against COVID-19, where severe cases are down to a level not seen since July of last year. Just a few days ago, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention issued a new mask guidelines. Under the new guidelines, most Americans and most of the country can now go mask-free. And based on projections, and based on projections, more of the country will reach a point across that point across the next couple of weeks. And thanks to the progress we've made in the past year, COVID-19 no longer need control our lives. I know some are talking about living with COVID-19, but tonight I say that we never will just accept living with COVID-19. We'll continue to combat the virus as we do other diseases. And because this virus mutates and spreads, we have to stay on guard. And here are four common-sense steps as we move forward safely, in my view. First, stay protected with vaccines and treatments. We know how incredibly effective vaccines are. If you're vaccinated and boosted, you have the highest degree of protection. And we'll never give up on vaccinating more Americans. Now, I know parents with kids under five are eager to see their vaccines authorized for their children. Scientists are working hard to get that done. We'll be ready with plenty of vaccines if and when they do. We're all ready. We, we are also ready with antiviral treatments. If you get COVID-19, the Pfizer pill reduces your chances of ending up in the hospital by 90 percent. I've ordered more pills than anyone in the world has. Pfizer is working overtime to get us a million pills this month and more than double that next month. And now we're launching the Test to Treat initiative. So people can get tested at a pharmacy, and if they prove positive, receive the antiviral pills on the spot at no cost. And folks, <clears throat> if, you're immo if you're immunocompromised or have some other vulnerability, we have treatments and free high-quality masks. We're leaving no one behind or ignoring anyone's needs as we move forward. On testing, we've made hundreds of millions of tests available, and you can order them for free to your doorstep. And we've already ordered free tests. If you already ordered free tests tonight, I'm announcing you can order another group of tests. COVID, go to covidtest.gov starting next week, and you can get more tests. Second, we must prepare for new variants. Over the past, we've gotten much better at detecting new variants. If necessary, we'll be able to develop new vaccines within 100 days instead of maybe months or years. And if Congress presides the funds we need, we'll have new stockpiles of tests, masks, pills ready if needed. I can't promise a new variant won't come, but I can, I can promise you we'll do everything within our power to be ready if it does. Third. <clears throat> We can end the shutdown of schools and businesses. We have the tools we need. It's time for America to get back to work and fill our great downtowns again with people. People working from home can feel safe and begin to return to their offices. We're doing that here in the federal government. The vast majority of federal workers will once again work in person. Our schools are open. Let's keep it that way. Our kids need to be in school. <clears throat> With 75 percent of adult, 75 percent of adult Americans fully vaccinated, and hospitalizations down by 77 percent, most Americans can remove their masks and stay in the classroom and move forward safely. We achieved this because we provided free vaccines, treatments, tests, and masks. Of course, continuing this costs money, so I'll not surprise you. I'll be back to see you all, and re I'm going to soon send a request to Congress. The vast majority of Americans have used these tools and may want again. We may need them again. So I expect Congress, and I hope you'll pass that quickly. Fourth, we'll continue vaccinating the world. We've sent 475 million vaccine doses 
to 112 countries, more than any nation on Earth. We won't stop. <clears throat> Because you can't build a wall high enough to keep out a, 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 a vaccine. The vaccine can stop the spread of these diseases. You know, we've lost so much in COVID-19. Time with one another. The worst of all, the much the loss of life. Let's use this moment to reset. So stop looking at COVID as a partisan dividing line. See it for what it is a god-awful disease. Let's stop sending each, seeing each other as enemies and start seeing each other for who we are, fellow Americans. Look. <laughs> we, we can't change how divided we've been. It was a long time in coming, but we can change how to move forward on COVID-19 and other issues that we must face together. I recently visited New York City Police Department days after the funerals of Officer Wilbur Mora and his partner, Officer Jason Rivera. They were responding to a 9-11 call when a man shot and killed them with a stolen gun. Officer Mora was 27 years old. Officer Rivera was 22 years old. Both Dominican Americans who grew up in the same streets that they later chose to parole to uh, patrol as police officers. I spoke with their families and I told them that we are forever in debt for their sacrifices and will carry on their mission to restore the trust and safety of every community deserves. Like some of you that have been around for a while, I've worked with you on these issues for a long time. I know what works investigating crime prevention and community policing, cops who walk the beat, who know the neighborhood, and who can restore trust and safety. Let's not abandon our streets or choose between safety and equal justice. Let's come together and protect our communities, restore trust, and hold law enforcement accountable. That's why the Justice Department has required body cameras, banned choke calls, and restricted no-knock warrants for its officers. That's why the American Rescue Plan that you all provided $350 billion that cities, states, and counties can use to hire more police, invest in more proven strategies. <clears throat> proven strategies like proven strategies like community violence interruption, trusted messengers breaking the cycle of violence and trauma and giving young people some hope. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. It's to fund the police. Fund them. Fund them. Fund them with resources and training. Resources and training they need to protect our communities. I ask Democrats and Republicans alike to pass my budget and keep our neighborhoods safe. And we'll do everything in my power to crack down on gun trafficking of ghost guns that you can buy online, assemble at home, no serial numbers, can't be traced. I ask Congress to pass proven measures to reduce gun violence, pass universal background checks. Why should anyone on the terrorist list be able to purchase a weapon? Why? Why? And folks, ban assault weapons with high capacity magazines that hold up to 100 rounds. You think the deer are wearing Kevlar vests? Look, repeal the liability shield that makes gun manufacturers the only industry in America that can't be sued. The only one. Imagine had we done that with the tobacco manufacturers. These laws don't infringe on the Second Amendment. They save lives. The most fundamental right in America is the right to vote and have it counted. And look, it's under assault. In state after state, new laws have been passed. Not only to suppress the vote, we've been there before, but to subvert the entire election. We can't let this happen. Tonight, I call on the Senate 
to pass, pass the Freedom to Vote Act, pass the John Lewis Act, Voting Rights Act. And while you're at it, pass the Disclose Act so Americans know who's funding our election. Look, tonight, I'd, l I'd like to honor someone who dedicated his life to serve this country, Justice Breyer, an Army veteran, constitutional scholar, retiring justice of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Breyer, thank you for your service. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean it. Get up, stand up and see you. Thank you. And we all know, no matter what your ideology, we all know one of the most serious constitutional responsibility a president has is nominating someone to serve on the United States Supreme Court. As I did four days ago, I've nominated the Circuit Court of Appeals, Katanji Brown Jackson, one of our nation's top legal minds, who continue in just broad Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence. A former top litigator in private practice, a former federal public defender, from a family of public school educators and police officers. She's a consensus builder. Since she's been nominated, she's received a broad range of support, including the Fraternal Order of Police and former judges supported by Democrats and Republicans. Folks, if we're to advance liberty and justice, we need to secure our border and fix the immigration system. And as you might guess, I think we can do both. At our border, we've installed new technology like cutting-edge scanners to better detect drug smuggling. We've set up joint patrols with Mexico and Guatemala to catch more human traffickers. We're putting in place dedicated immigration judges in a significant larger number so families fleeing persecution and violence can have their curses, cases heard faster and those who don't legitimately hear can be sent back. We're screening. We're securing commitments and supporting partners in South and Central America to host more refugees and secure their own borders. We can do all this while keeping lit the torch of liberty that has led the generation of immigrants to this land, my forebears and many of yours. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, those with temporary status, farm workers, essential workers. Revise our laws so businesses have workers they need and families don't wait decades to reunite. It's not only the right thing to do, it's economically smart thing to do. That's why the immigration reform is supported by everyone from labor unions to religious leaders to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Let's get it done once and for all. Folks, advancing liberty and justice also requires protecting the rights of women. The constitutional right affirmed by Roe v. Wade, standing precedent for half a century, is under attack as never before. If you want to go forward, not backwards, we must protect access to health care, preserve a woman's right to choose, and continue to advance maternal health care for all Americans. And folks, for our LGBTQ plus Americans, Let's finally get the Bipartisan Equality Act to my desk. The onslaught of state laws targeting transgender Americans and their families. It's simply wrong. And I said last year, especially to our younger transgender Americans, I'll always have your back as your president so you can be yourself and reach your God-given potential. Folks, As I've just demonstrated, while it often appears we do not agree, <laughs> and that we, we do agree on a lot more things than we acknowledge, I signed 80 bipartisan bills in the law last year, from preventing government shutdowns, to protecting Asian Americans from still-too-common hate crimes, 
to reforming military justice, and will soon be strengthening the Violence Against Women Act that I first wrote three decades ago. It's important. It's important for us to show, to show the nation we can come together and do big things. So tonight, I'm offering a unity agenda for the nation. Four big things we can do together, in my view. First, beat the opioid e epidemic. There's so much we can do. Increase funding for prevention, treatment, harm reduction and recovery. Get rid of outdated rules and stop doctors and, and the, that stop doctors from pres prescribing treatments. Stop the flow of illicit drugs by working with state and local law enforcement to go after the traffickers. And if you're suffering from addiction, you know you should know you're not alone. I believe in recovery, and I celebrate the 23 million, 23 million Americans in recovery. Second, let's take on mental health, especially among our children whose lives and education have been turned upside down. The American Rescue Plan gave schools money to hire teachers and help students make up for lost learning. I urge every parent to make sure your school, your school does just that. They have the money. We can all play a part. Sign up to be a tutor or a mentor. Children were also struggling before the pandemic. Bullying, violence, trauma, and the harms of social media. As Frances Haugen, who is here tonight with us, has shown, we must hold social media platforms accountable for the national experiment they're conducting on our children for profit. Folks, thank you. Thank you for the courage you showed. It's time to strengthen privacy protections, ban targeted advertising to children, demand tech companies stop collecting personal data on our children, and let's get all Americans the mental health services they need. More people can turn for help and full parity between physical and mental health care if we treat it that way in our insurance. Look. The third piece of that agenda is support our veterans. Veterans are the backbone and the spine of this country. They're the best of us. I've always believed that we have a sacred obligation to equip those we send to war and care for those and their family when they come home. My administration is providing assistance in job training, housing, and now helping lower-income veterans get VA care debt-free. And our troops in Iraq have faced — in Afghanistan have faced many dangers, one being stationed at bases breathing in toxic smoke from burn pits. Many of you have been there. I've been in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan over 40 times. These burn pits that incinerate waste, the waste of war, medical and hazardous material, jet fuel, and so much more. And they come home, many of the world's fittest and best trained warriors in the world, never the same. Headaches, numbness, dizziness, a cancer that would put them in a flag draped coffin. I know. One of those — one of those soldiers was my son, Major Bo Biden. I don't know for sure if the burn pit that he lived near, that his hooch was near in Iraq and earlier than that in Kosovo, is the cause of his brain cancer, the disease of so many other troops. But I am committed to find out everything we can, committed to military families like Danielle Robinson from Ohio, the widow of Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson. He was born a soldier, Army National Guard, combat medic in Kosovo and Iraq, stationed near Baghdad, just yards from burn pits the size of football fields. Danielle is here with us tonight. They love going to Ohio State football games.
And they love building Legos with their daughter. But cancer from prolonged exposure to burn pits ravaged Heath's lungs and body. Danielle says Heath was a fighter to the very end. He didn't know how to stop fighting, and neither did she. Through her pain, she found purpose to demand that we do better. Tonight, Danielle, we are going to do better. The VA, the VA is pioneering new ways of linking toxic exposure to disease, already helping more veterans get benefits. And tonight, I'm announcing we're expanding eligibility to veterans suffering from nine respiratory cancers. I'm also calling on Congress to pass a law to make sure veterans devastated by toxic exposure in Iraq and Afghanistan finally get the benefits and the comprehensive health care they deserve. And fourth and last, Let's end cancer as we know it. This is personal. This is personal to me and to Jill and to Kamala and so many of you. So many of you have lost someone you love, husband, wife, son, daughter, mom, dad, Cancer is the number two cause of death in America, second only to heart disease. Last month, I announced the plan to supercharge the cancer moonshot that President Obama asked me to lead six years ago. Our goal is to cut cancer death rates by at least 50 percent over the next 25 years. I think we can do better than that. Turn cancers from death sentences into treatable diseases. More support for patients and their families. To get there, I call on Congress to fund what I call ARPA-H, Advanced, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, patterned after DARPA and the Defense Department, projects that led in DARPA to the Internet, GPS, and so much more that make our forces more safer and be able to wage war more with more clarity. ARPA will have a singular purpose to drive breakthroughs in cancer, Alzheimer's and diabetes, and more. A unity agenda for the nation. We can do these things. It's within our power. And I don't see a partisan edge to any one of those four things. My fellow Americans, tonight, we've gathered in this sacred space, a citadel of democracy, in this capital, Generation after generation of Americans have debated great questions amid great strife and have done great things. We fought for freedom, expanded liberty, debated totalitarianism and terror. We built the strongest, freest, and most prosperous nation the world has ever known. Now is the hour, our moment of responsibility, our test of resolve and conscience, of history itself, it is in this moment that our character of this generation is formed. Our purpose is found. Our future is forged. Well, I know this nation. We'll meet the test, protect freedom and liberty, expand fairness and opportunity, and we will save democracy. As hard as those times have been, I'm more optimistic about America today than I've been my whole life, because I see the future that's within our grasp, because I know there's simply nothing beyond our, our capacity. We're the only nation on Earth that has always turned every crisis we faced into an opportunity, the only nation that can be defined by a single word, possibilities. So on this night, on our 245th year as a nation, I've come to report on the state of the nation, the state of the union. And my report is this. The state of the union is strong because you, the American people, are strong. We are stronger today. We are stronger today than we were a year ago. And we'll be stronger a year from now than we are today. This is our moment.
to meet and overcome the challenges of our time. And we will, as one people, one America, the United States of America. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Go get him.
Got something on you guys. You better be careful. You got some now, I've been around. 
That's clear. Declares the joint session of the two houses now dissolved. That means the president has left. And it took President Biden about 20 minutes to get out of the chamber after greeting many members of Congress, mostly from the Democratic side. About an hour in length was his State of the Union speech. Ukraine, the economy and infrastructure dominated. Crime and policing, immigration also came up along with health care and several other issues. Well, the President and Mrs. Biden will be returning to the White House now, but C-SPAN will be continuing our coverage in just a few minutes. Kim Reynolds, the governor of Iowa, will be giving the Republican response. We will be live with that. After that, we want to hear from you. Here's how you can get a hold of us. 202 is the area code, 748-8920. If for those of you who live in the East and Central time zones, 202-748-8921. For those of you in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, if you can't get through on the phone, still want to make a comment, you can do it via text, 202-748-8903. Again, that's for text messages only, reacting to the President's speech and the Republican response. Please include your first name and your city if you would. Also, continue the conversation on all our social media sites, at C-SPAN is what you need to remember. Coming up on C-SPAN 2, you're going to hear from members of Congress and get their reaction to the president's speech. That will be live from Statuary Hall on C-SPAN 2, and that's probably started already right now. Let's check in with Greta Brauner one more time before Kim Reynolds speaks. You mentioned this, Peter, that the speech was about an hour. Take a look at how that compares. C-SPAN tweeted this out earlier tonight. A comparison of length of speeches from previous State of the Union addresses. President Biden coming in at around one hour and two minutes, according to CNN's Jake Tapper. We'll see if that, uh, what the exact number is, but that would be a little less than President Obama in 2016. And then West Wing um, tonight, West Wing reports, these are the numbers of, these are the mentions of certain words, the number of times President Biden mentioned words like jobs and the economy in his speech tonight. And then if you were wondering who was the designated survivor, it was Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. She was the designated survivor from the cabinet chosen to stay away in case something would happen. Supreme Court justices in the chamber, Jennifer Epstein with Bloomberg reporting, five members of the Supreme Court were in the chamber tonight, Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. That left conservative justices Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch not attending along with liberal justice Sotomayor. And then uh, also, uh, we showed, told you this earlier, it looked like a peer, it, there was a signed seating tonight. You might have noticed that members were spaced out. This from Billy House, who reports on Capitol Hill. Every other seat was empty and lawmakers were assigned in the gallery, the mezzanine. Who decided where members sat? It was the caucus leaders from both parties and leadership who decided. As we mentioned, Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds will be giving the GOP response tonight. Uh, this is reporting from Hill newspaper on what she'll focus on. Her focus will be inflation, schools response, 
uh, to Biden as as well. And then she made some news in her state today as well. Take a look at this picture. She signed a tax cut bill. These are the official pens ready to go, she tweeted out for the state's most historic tax reform bill. And then finally, I want to share this video with you of Governor Reynolds. She was asked recently in an interview how she prepares for big speeches like tonight. Take a listen. Do you have any like election day big speech type superstitions that come to mind? No. I'm a I, very superstitious person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, person. yeah. So, I, think I, one, I think one of the things <laughs> that I've really, that, that's helped me prepare for an election or for tonight is just, uh, you know, prayer. Um, I appreciate all the prayers. Uh, I actually have a sister-in-law that I call a lot of times before I get ready to do the condition of the state or head into an election and, and actually ask her to say a prayer for me uh, before the big events. Do you have any like... And here is Governor Reynolds live. I'm Kim Reynolds, governor of the great state of Iowa. Like you, I just watched the president's address. I listened as the governor of our state, as a mom and a grandmother of 11, who's worried our country is on the wrong track. We're now one year into his presidency, and instead of moving America forward, it feels like President Biden and his party have sent us back in time to the late 70s and early 80s when runaway inflation was hammering families, a violent crime wave was crashing our cities, and the Soviet army was trying to redraw the world map. Even before taking the oath of office, the president told us that he wanted to, quote, make America respected around the world again, and to unite us here at home. He's failed on both fronts. The disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal did more than cost American lives. It betrayed our allies and emboldened our enemies. North Korea is testing missiles again at an alarming rate. The Speaker of the House recently warned our Olympic athletes not to speak out against China. And now Russia has launched an unprovoked full-scale military invasion of Ukraine, an attack on democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. Now all Americans must stand united in solidarity with the brave people of Ukraine as they courageously defend their country against Putin's tyranny as they fight for their freedom. But we shouldn't ignore what happened in the run-up to Putin's invasion, waiving sanctions on Russian pipelines while eliminating oil production here at home, focusing on political correctness rather than military readiness, reacting to world events instead of driving them. Weakness on the world stage has a cost, and the president's approach to foreign policy has consistently been too little, too late. It's time for America to once again project confidence. It's time to be decisive. It's time to lead. But we can't project strength abroad if we're weak at home. And that's what I want to discuss with you tonight. The President and Democrats in Congress have spent the last year either ignoring the issues facing Americans or making them worse. They were warned that spending trillions would lead to soaring inflation. They were told that their anti-energy policies would send gas prices to new heights. But they plowed ahead anyway, raising the price at the pump by 50% and pushing inflation to a 40-year high. Four decades ago, when our nation was last reeling from inflation, I was a young working mom just starting out. My husband, Kevin, worked days while I watched our girls, and then we would literally switch. We would pass in the yard as he was coming home, and I was leaving to work evenings at the local grocery store. From across that checkout counter, I saw the pain of inflation on my neighbors' faces. I saw what happens when prices rise faster than wages. The Biden administration believes inflation is a, quote, high-class problem. I can tell you, it's an everybody problem. I saw moms and dads' paychecks buy them less and less. I watched working people choose which essentials to take home and which ones to leave behind. And now President Biden's decisions have a whole new generation feeling that same pain. 
When I took the oath of office five years ago, I promised Iowans that I would never lose sight of who I was working for, that I wouldn't become detached from the problems they were facing, from the problems that I had faced myself. But you don't have to check groceries to see what high inflation does to people. You just need to step outside of the DC bubble. Talk to Americans about what's on their mind. Ask them, what are your concerns? What keeps you up at night? And they'll tell you. And I can tell you what's not on that list. They won't tell you that spending trillions more and bankrupting their children is the answer to their problems. They won't tell you that we should be paying people not to work. And they certainly won't tell you that we should give billions in tax giveaways to millionaires and billionaires in Democrat-controlled states like California, New York, and New Jersey. But that's what the Biden administration has been pushing for over the last year. And that's all part of Build Back Better. Thankfully, the president's agenda didn't pass because even members of his own party said enough is enough. Well, the American people share that view. Enough is enough. And it's not just with DC spending. Americans are tired of a political class trying to remake this country into a place where an elite few tell everyone else what they can and cannot say, what they can and cannot believe. They're tired of people pretending the way to end racism is by categorizing everybody by their race. They're tired of politicians who tell parents they should sit down, be silent, and let government control their kids' education and future. Frankly, they are tired of the theater, where politicians do one thing when the cameras are rolling and another when they believe you can't see them, where governors and mayors enforce mandates but don't follow them where elected leaders tell their citizens to stay home while they sneak off to Florida for sun and fun, where they demand that your child wear a mask, but they go maskless. So you've heard the excuses. They were just holding their breath, but it's the American people who are waiting to exhale, waiting for the insanity to stop. We now live in a country where violent crime is out of control. Liberal prosecutors are letting criminals off easy, and many prominent Democrats still want to defund the police. You know, it seems like everything is backwards. The Biden administration requires vaccines for Americans who want to go to work or protect this country, but not for migrants who illegally cross the border. The Department of Justice treats parents like domestic terrorists, but looters and shoplifters roam free. The American people are left to feel like they're the enemy. This is not the same country it was a year ago. The president tried to paint a different picture tonight, but his actions over the last 12 months don't match the rhetoric. It's not what he promised when he took office, but it doesn't have to be that way there is an alternative. Across the nation, Republican governors and legislators are showing Americans what conservative leadership looks like, what it means to respect the people we serve, to hear them out, to stand up for them and walk alongside them. We know that our problems require bold action, but we also know that bold action doesn't have to mean government action. It's Americans making their own decisions for their own families and future. Republican governors face the same COVID-19 virus head on. But we honored your freedoms and saw right away that lockdowns and school closures, they came with their own significant cost, that mandates weren't the answer. And we actually listened to the science especially with kids in masks and kids in schools. What happened and is still happening to our children over the last two years is unconscionable. Learning loss, isolation, anxiety, depression. In so many states, our kids have been left behind and so many will never catch up. 
That's why Iowa was the first state in the nation to require that schools open their doors. I was attacked by the left, I was attacked by the media, but it wasn't a hard choice. It was the right choice. And keeping schools open is only the start of the pro-parent, pro-family revolution that Republicans are leading in Iowa and states across this country. Republicans believe that parents matter. It was true before the pandemic and it has never been more important to say out loud, parents matter. They have a right to know and to have a say in what their kids are being taught. Families also have every right to live in a safe and a secure community. And that begins with a safe and secure country. But the Biden administration has refused to secure our border. They've refused to provide the resources to stop human trafficking, to stop the staggering influx of deadly drugs coming into our neighborhoods. They've refused to protect you. With Texas and Arizona leading the way, I, along with Republican governors from several states, have sent resources to the border. And we've actually gone to the border, something that our president and vice president have yet to do since taking office. On the economy, the contrast couldn't be more stark. While Democrats in D.C. are spending trillions, sending inflation soaring, Republican leaders around the country are balancing budgets and cutting taxes because we know that money spent on Main Street is better than money spent on bureaucracy. Today, I signed legislation that eliminates Iowa's tax on retirement income and sets our tax rate at 3.9%. That's less than half of what it was just four years ago. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that out of the top 20 states with the lowest unemployment rates, 17 have Republican governors. Republicans may not have the White House, but we're doing what we can to fill the leadership vacuum. And on the issues that are affecting Americans, Republicans are leading. We're standing up for parents and kids. We're standing up for life. We're keeping our communities safe and thanking those in uniform. We're fighting to restore America's energy independence, and that includes biofuels. We're getting people back to work, not paying them to stay home. Most of all, we're respecting your freedom. Behind me stands Iowa's Capitol, where we display our state motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. And those aren't just empty words. It's a belief that the greatness of this state and this country lies in our people, not government. You shouldn't have to wake up every morning and worry about the next thing the government is going to do to you, your business, or your children. If we as elected leaders are doing our job, then the government is working well, but operating in the background. It's supporting the ingenuity and spirit of our people, not drowning them out. It's keeping them safe, not restricting their freedom. That's what I believe, that's what Republicans believe, and that's what Republicans are doing. I am so blessed to be the governor of Iowa, where people are humble, hardworking, and patriotic. We take care of each other. And yes, we are, as they say, Iowa nice. But you don't have to be from Iowa to see that those are the values of America at its best, all of America. Over the last few years, I've put my faith in Iowans, and they haven't let me down. I encourage this president to do the same, to put his faith in you, the American people, who have never wavered in your belief in this country, regardless of who leads it. Because you know, you've shown that the soul of America isn't about who lives in the White House. It's men and women like you in every corner of this nation who are willing to step up 
and take responsibility for your communities, for your neighbors, and ultimately for yourselves by that most important measure at least. The state of our union is indeed strong. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. And that was Kim Reynolds from Des Moines. She was appointed governor in 2017 when longtime governor Terry Branstad became the ambassador to China in the Trump administration. She won on her own in 2018. Time to hear your voices now. What do you think the State of the Union is? What did you think of both President Biden's speech and the Republican response? Michael in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, you're first up. Go ahead and make your comment. 